All right, so let's get this Caribbean show on the road. Thank you, everyone. Um, hi, Voz. Thank you for joining. And welcome to all persons as you arrive. Please feel free to share by clicking all panelists and attendees and share your name, where you're from, and your pronouns in the chat. We're going to get started. I'll invite our panelists to turn on their videos. Um, that will be most helpful so that you know we can make this a nice warm space for people to see our lovely faces. Um, so just to start things off, um, just some housekeeping. Just going to ask um, everyone to keep your microphone muted um, unless you're speaking for the duration of the panel presentation. As you join, um, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat, sharing your name, your pronouns, if you wish your organizational affiliation and where you're joining us from. The floor for today will be a 30 to 35 minute panel presentation, which I'll be moderating. Um, my name is Nish McLean. I am the Caribbean Program Officer here at Outright Action International. My pronouns are he, him, they, them, and I'm joining you today from Jamaica. After we have the um, panel presentation, we will for sure leave time about 15 to 20 minutes for your questions. And we encourage you, there is a Q&A function. If you scroll across your screen, you can just drop your questions there and we'll answer them live. Depending on the question, we may respond to the question in the chat. If you have a question for a particular panelist, please feel free to just um, name the person that you have the question for and they'll be more than happy to respond once we get to the q a i'm delighted to be to be hosting this session here uh, i'm joined by my esteemed colleagues from across the region elijah alexis alexa and yaisa so um, i'm gonna ask them each to take a moment to introduce themselves and uh, so briefly i am just going to start to in that same order of names, so Elijah, Alexa, Alexis, and then Yaisa. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Elijah Caesar. I am a trans man. My pronouns are he, him, coming out of Georgetown, Guyana, that is in South America. I am an independent activist and a registered nurse. Happy to be here. Happy to share. Thank you, Elijah. And then we move over to Alexa, then Alexis. Good morning, everyone. My name is Alexa Hoffman. I am the chair of the United Caribbean Trans Network and I'm also the director of Trans Advocacy and Agitation Barbados. Um, I'm a trans woman and my pronouns are she, her. Good morning, everybody. My name is Alexis DeMarco, the executive director for UC Trans, hailing from the Bahamas. My pronouns are she. All right, and last but certainly not least, our colleague Yaisa, the floor is yours. Yaisa, can you hear us? All right, so we'll come right back to Yaisa, perhaps having some internet issues. Um, so we'll just we'll swing swing right back to um, Yaisa before you talk to to give any to give your introduction. All right, so just to start things off, right, I'm going to ask all our panelists um, to close your eyes for a moment. Right, so just close your eyes, and um, I want you to think about your journey. Think about your struggles, think about your resilience, keep your eyes closed, and think about your community. I want you to reflect on those that paved the way for us to be right here in this moment where we are, hosting a panel on gender identity recognition in the Caribbean where we can share a space to tell our stories and to give or colleagues, or peers, or allies, an idea of our realities. Think about our elders, think about our forerunners. Before we even had language to name our identity, think about all of that. What do you see? How far have we come? What do you feel? Now, open your eyes, 
And starting with Caesar, can you tell us what you felt and what you saw in that moment? Just unmute. Well, for me, I saw young and old trans bodies taking steps to affirm their identity and associate with it. Uh, when this wasn't the case in the past, where you would uh, cover and bury what we felt within uh, due to fear and resentment. I see trans people aspiring to complete their studies, graduating with degrees, breaking away from the sex selling narrative, and not to say that uh, sex work is uh, anything but sex work is work. And we know it's long, hard, bad breaking work. Um, but uh, it's good to see the trans people utilizing other opportunities that is less mentally and physically taxing that uh, can be attained through a sound education, skill, and uh, protection of the law. I feel proud to see my brothers and sisters pushing boundaries, building on the work of those who came before us, uh, taking up space and living the truth. Uh, for there's no greater peace than being one with oneself. Thank you. A really great way to start and just to really ground us in this conversation about where we are, where we've come, and how much further we have to go, but celebrating some of those wins. Um, Alexa, would you like to jump in and tell us, you know, um, what you felt, what you saw um, in that moment? Well, to be honest, I didn't close my eyes for this one because it's usually very embedded in my mind. Um, since some of it are my own personal experiences that I've dealt with, my own experiences that I live um, each and every day. Um, uh, there's just one question. When you say how far we've come and how far we have to go, you're meaning specifically in the Caribbean context or can it be on an international because both came through my mind at the same time? Um, let me start with the global. Um, I see that there's still some work that needs to be done there's still the issue where people, I mean, when you look at the wider LGBTI community, people can readily understand things like sexual attraction, sexual orientation. Um, but when it comes down now to things such as gender identity, sexual identity, gender expression, people are still having problems wrapping their head around it. And when it comes to the social and political infrastructure, there's some work that needs to be done so that we can, we as trans people can be on the same tier as our lesbian, gay, bisexual um, peers. Regionally, that effect increases tenfold where some people are still having problems where they conflate sexual orientation with gender identity and they still can't quite divorce the two. And I see that leads to situations where a lot of stereotypes are getting into the way. Um, a lot of, of prejudices, uh, they just keep popping up every time we try to do something, even something as simple as holding down a job. Like Elijah said, being able to see, at least how I interpreted it, seeing opportunities for employment that are beyond sex work is still something that trans people in the Caribbean tend to find challenges with. And there's a lot of work that needs to be done there as well as the legal infrastructure being able to protect our human rights and offer us a means of being made whole again when we're injured. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I think indeed it's how do we feel whole as trans people, you know, and that's, that's the conversation that we're going to be having and about all our rights, what, what we deserve as a community in the region. So thank you much, very much for sharing that, Alexa. Um, over to you, Alexis. What was that experience like for you? Um, I was watching your facial expressions and I could see a multitude of emotion um, pass, through your, you pass over your face as your eyes were closed. So tell us, um, what did you feel and what did you see as in, that, in those moments? Well, for me, what I saw was a transitioning moment as far as where we started from where we are now, especially here in my country, the Bahamas, the plight of visibility. I saw us crossing this bridge 
and we're right now at the middle of this bridge because there has been a vast improvement as it relates to um, education on gender identity in the Bahamas and I can also say within the Caribbean region. Although there are some still some struggles within the region, I think we have made a mark, especially in the English speaking Caribbean region as it relates to our visibility and who we are as trans citizens. So when I closed my eyes, I saw this bridge of us being to the bottom of the bridge. Now we're to the middle of the bridge and we're trying to get over this bridge. Thank you. I think that's, that's very hopeful. And it also honors and respects the journey and where we have come from and how much further we have to go. So thanks for sharing that. That's a really great analogy. Um, Yaisa, I'm not sure if you're back with us. I know you're probably having a little bit of internet challenges. Uh, here we are, lovely. So, I'm here. All right. Yes, I'm here. I'm with you guys. All right. We can just introduce yourself and just tell us um, a little bit about where you think things are. Um, when you when you think about our community, where we've been, our journey, our resilience, our struggles, what we've had to overcome. What does that, how does that resonate with you? Can you share a little bit about that, please? Yes, hi. Um, once again, yeah, Isabel um, in Haiti. As a situation in Haiti um, is the same, we, there, is, there has been progress and not progress at the same time. The only, because um, we were way, way back and now people actually know there's interest, there's knowledge of trans identity. Yeah, that, that's, you know, so for us, that's a step in the process. Yeah, Yaisa, you're muted. Hello? Yes, I'm back. So <laughs> I was receiving a call. So which is, again, as I was saying, which is a step in the right direction. Oh, you do have to excuse me, I have a cough, so. <laughs> And as I speak, I tend to call so I can text, so I'm going to be brief. So as we know recently, because of the visibility, uh, the trans, because there are issues, we need to be visible. And because of that visibility and because of the dialogue on, on trans issues and transgender identity and in and of itself, you know, there was a decree that was passed June 16th, which is the first time, with, although it caused a lot of uproar and there's not really progress, but again, it's the conversation now. People, there's inclusion, at least in the dialogue. You know, as far <coughs> sorry, as trans um, identity in Haiti. So I think that that is progress in and of itself. It's not, it's a beginning, but which is, I think, best considered progress. Thank you very much. Thank you all for sharing. Um, so I'm going to move the conversation a little bit now towards. Um, just so we, as we know, for, for those of us who are joining or who may not be sure of where things are in the Caribbean region, across the region, we know that we have a far way to go, as the panelists have shared thus far, regarding the rights of trans people in the Caribbean. And taking into issues, taking issues such as unemployment, violence, homelessness, you know, and still also reflecting on or increased visibility, activism that's happening nationally and regionally. How would you describe, and um, Yaisa started that conversation, started to do that a little bit talking about the decree. How would you describe the climate in your country as it regards to trans rights? So I would ask each person, Alexa, Yaisa, and Caesar, to share a little bit about their national context. And Alexis, as the chair of UC Trans, will talk a little bit more about the regional context. So starting with um, Alexa, the floor is yours to share. Okay. Um, <clears throat> This, this gets a little bit complex for me because um, where the national context is concerned, I've had a number of things to say on it, primarily because, as I like to put it, I have a horse in the race, being I as a trans person building my life here in Barbados amidst people who would be insisting that I'd be better off elsewhere. And I always rebut them by saying, why should I have to pick up stakes and go to another country to live a life that I should be able to enjoy here where I was born. Um, the national context is one that in my opinion, and this is both my opinion personally, and my opinion as someone who deals in human rights mechanisms, um, there's, as I said earlier, there's much work that needs to be done. 
uh, a fine example would be how we had the Employment Prevention of Discrimination Bill that was debated and passed in Parliament where the, um, the, they wanted to more or less adjust the climate of the world of work to be one where there was less discrimination, um, whether it related to your religion, your ethnicity, your country of origin, your marital status, and your sexual orientation. And there was a whole slew of categories, I think about 13, 15, probably closer to 20. And there was a decided absence of gender identity and expression. And I started to, you know, poke around and ask questions. Why is it that this was left out? If there was, according to what many parliamentarians said, there was a joint select committee where consultations were had with civil society and supposedly that would also include that trans advocates were included. Why is it that gender identity and expression was excluded? And I found it even more disturbing because like I said, I have a horse in the race. I have a matter that's before the Employment Rights Tribunal, um, which came about because I had to use the mechanisms provided under a statute that has been in standing for the last eight years. And how come it is, you, I have this case going on. It was, you know, highly publicized. You know, there's been talk going on about it. And this is something that I have even been talking about for years before that. And yet somehow trans people were left out completely. Why was that? And it, it what also bothered me was that they seemed to be, it, it seemed almost as if I was the only person who was getting so disturbed by it. I wasn't hearing or seeing anything from, you know, other organizations saying, hey, you know, here's an omission. We need to fix this. In fact, I had many people come to me and tell me, just take it easy. We can, you know, always wait for an amendment. But I said, the Employment Rights Act was enacted in 2012. This bill came to be discussed in 2020. Am I supposed to wait another eight years before I'm included? You know, it's unreasonable to even expect me to wait one year. So that's, that's just a, a, a snippet of what the climate is like, where trans people's human rights are often, you know, forgotten about or tapped on as an afterthought and where individuals may try to push to have gender identity included. It is seen as either a disturbance or a flat out aberration. You know, why are you wanting to push this now? Why can't you just wait until another time? But the reality is we were always here. We were here for the longest time. How long do you expect us to wait? So that's, that's my observation of the social climate and my take on you know, where it's at right now. Thank you so much. And we're going to shortly talk specifically about gender identity recognition. So thank you for prefacing um, you know, the history and your experiences in Barbados for those of who, those of us who are joining that, who may not know where you're from, from Barbados and the, you know, the cases that you have before the courts at this time. So thank you so much for sharing that, Alexa. All right, so I'm going to um, ask um, Alex, uh, sorry, I think Yaisa to share a little bit. Um, perhaps Yaisa, you could talk a little bit about the decree, similarly about how trans people are left the behind. The decree as an example. Yes. You know, we talk about the decree talks about sexual orientation and but not necessarily about gender identity. Gender Can you identity. Give, give um, exactly. our attendees a little bit of an idea of what the decree is about and perhaps just in terms of some context about how trans people fare in Haiti. All right, thank you. Uh, Haiti being the poorest country in the hemisphere, so people have a sense nationally that of all the issues that we're facing, you know, we're the poorest, education, um, high infant mortality, et cetera, and the lack of opportunity, the lack of um, access, that, you know, to education, healthcare, overall for the overall population. So the general tendency uh, um, seems to be like, this is not an important issue. Why, of all the things to discuss, why are you bringing up gender identity? This is something for well-to-do countries, um, European and American countries, that seems to be the general sense. But then again, what they don't understand is there is a whole population of people who are outside, as I always say, outside of these already meager resources. So it's not a fantasy. It's not that they seem to think like, you know, you guys just want to follow trends and you're following 
what the Americans are doing, what you know, what the internationals are doing, who are way better off. But now, so aside from bringing awareness of gender identity, we have to bring awareness that there is a community, there is a trans community which is ignored, and this is what they're facing. Yes, it's a hard country where you know their resources are slim to none, but guess what? You have a community of people who are outside of that, who have no representation, who are you know not seen, unseen, unknown. Again, in reference to law, because when you say LGBTI in Haiti, people just see gay and they see sexual orientation. So there has been work, there has been um, you know, work that people kind of understand, not accept fully, but understand. So on the forefront, which is gender, um, sexual orientation. But now, so we're making a difference. There is gender identity issues. So, you know, so that's new. So that's something that people need to know. Like, for example, we need to work on getting, uh, like, I have a shelter and we have trans girls and being visible, letting them see this is the reality. For example, um, you have a mother who has six children and she can't feed them. So the mindset is like, I have, you know, to save the good ones. So if you're already trans or LGBT, whatever to them, I'll kick you out and be done with you because, you know, then I'll have one less because you're already to them, you're already lost. So that's the kind of mindset. That's the kind of, you know, what's going on, they don't understand. So people don't understand. Yes, you know, there are important issues, as they say, but we have been affected doubly by these important issues. Now, as for the decree, as we're saying, the attitude, it's like people do confuse gender identity still with sexual orientation. So once they figured, oh yeah, we mentioned that, so what are you complaining about? So they, they also, there needs to be more promotion, more education, let understand that trans issues, gender identity issues are something totally distinct with their own set of needs and et cetera. Um, as it is for HIV, the people, they are KP clinics and they are gay friendly. But for example, people don't understand like a trans male who they are trans male who wants to go, uh, you know, sexual reproductive issues, one, you know, who has an infection, they don't go, they don't go to clinics, you know, they don't seek out HIV testing or treatment because of stigma, because they're unaccounted for. And as you can see, the decree says, yeah, we mentioned that, you know, gay people can do this and that, so we talked about you. So it's not, now the attempt is, the first time they mentioned like anybody who has undergone morphological changes, which is not very specific, what does that mean? Uh, as I said to them, like growing old is a morphological change, gaining weight is a morphological change. So, you know, be more specific. I think um, there has been work, there's, there's the willingness and an unwillingness. It's like, let's talk about it without talking about it because they're trying not to ruffle feathers. So again, so in a nutshell, I think in the national context in Haiti, people need to understand that gender identity is an issue. It's not a whim, it's not a fashion, and it's not unimportant. And it, you know, compared to the all national issues. So yes, they're, they, are, they are citizens, we are people, and we are uh, in, impacted doubly by all these national issues that everybody are, you know, people are uh, complaining about. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for, the, for that context. And, you know, like you said, like representation matters and like naming our communities and making sure that people understand that there is a community to begin with exactly. and that the community is doubly impacted by this, um, the sociopolitical context. The national and, issues, exactly. So indeed, um, very much so. So thank you very much for that, Yaisa. Um, Caesar. Um, over to you to share a little bit about Guyana. Like we, for for those of the panel um, attendees who have joined who may not know, Guyana has struck down a uh, cross-dressing law. And, you know, we know that this disproportionately had impacted trans women in particular, um, even though, again, we, we, we know that our communities are very much marginalized, very much underrepresented and impacted by various laws and policies negatively. And so Guyana is one of, was the only country this side of the world that still had that cross-dressing law on the books. Um, so that's one thing that we do know of, but what else can you share with us? And you can talk a little bit about that cross-dressing law and some of the challenges that maybe still exist, because we know that a law cha changing in our context doesn't mean that public sentiment is good. So can you speak with us a little bit about um, where things are in Guyana? All right, so 
as it relates to the climate, I would say it's very cloudy with little to no chance of sunlight. And I can't even tell you if you're going to see a rainbow. Because the closest thing we have to rights or trans rights over here is, as you mentioned, uh, in 2018, when we had the cross-dressing law stripped uh, from the books, which stated that uh, no man or woman can present in a public place dressed in garments of the opposite sex for an improper purpose. Now, uh, that law was successfully challenged by a group of trans women, and uh, that's, that, that's, basically, that's basically all the rights we have, and that's merely a drop in the bucket of things that need to be addressed for trans people uh, over here. I mean, and we recently had a tug of war between governments, and uh, now we have uh, the previous government sitting in, uh, which previously expressed uh, little to no interest in uh, trans rights or LGBT rights in the whole. Uh, so I fear that very little will be done moving forward for the community, uh, but we still have to continue pushing pushing, uh, fighting, and see how far we can get. So uh, people are still, uh, trans women, trans men even, are still treated with discrimination, are still hostile on the road. Uh, some can't even necessarily go to uh, the police station to make reports, because when you go to the police station, the police are laughing at you, they're videoing you, they're posting it on social media, so they're not taking you seriously. Uh, well, the fight continues. And, uh, Fight was on. Thank you. Very, like, very sobering, um, Elijah. Thank you so much for sharing that. I mean, you know, like the the things that our communities have to endure, um, you know, just to access basic rights, to go to the police station for support in an emergency situation, and then to be ridiculed by the very person that you're seeking protection from. You know, it's it's disheartening. Like, um getting chills just thinking about it, you know, and thinking about many cases across the region in Jamaica, in Trinidad, you know, for the countries that are not represented like physically on this call, for all of us, we, we know the struggle, we stand in solidarity with our communities. And this is why this is so important to have this platform to share and to really name the issues. Um, and this is an important mo mo moment in our movement in order to ensure that we continue to champion our issues and ensure that you know, justice prevails and that the rights that we know are enshrined, should be enshrined in our constitutions, you know, in our laws and policies that we as activists and the faces of our communities that we ensure that this, this comes to be, you know, in our generation and not just for us, for other young trans people who are out there younger than us, older than us, for all of us. Alexis, um, would you like to just talk to us a little bit about giving us regional um, context um, for trans issues across the Caribbean? Well, as we heard from a few of our countries, like Guyana expressed, Barbados expressed, and that Mishi just talked about um, Jamaica, there are still some countries that are left behind in the advocacy response to trans citizens. And I'm going to use this word trans citizen specifically because the human rights of a citizen of a country is very important. And I think for us regionally starting to identify as citizens first of that country and showing our governments and showing our decision makers that we are left behind to basic things and basic needs as citizens. So regionally we have the situation um, in St. Lucia, in Antigua, where these trans persons can't even have a right to their identity based on um, the religious doctrine that is indoctrinated in our Caribbean countries. Access to food. We have seen that COVID-19 regionally has impacted the way citizens of a country get access to food, get access to healthcare. Even when it comes down to access for healthcare for trans citizens during COVID-19, with some of these organizations on the ground, such as Samaritan Purse, which is actually in my country, after reviewing their history of discrimination against key population groups, we had to begin to create advocacy surrounding this in this particular group. So you can see that trans citizens have, um, a, a have, don't have the opportunities as regular citizens within the country and regionally, we're mapping out these issues. And through our survey that has been created, thank you, Outright, for 
helping us create this Caribbean Trans Survey that we'll be able to have the data that we need to present to our government. Regionally, we all, we all have these issues of the access to education, the access to employment, the access to healthcare, and we still battle with stigma and discrimination across the board as trans citizens in accessing basic needs as a citizen of the country. So the situation on the ground, I can say through some education, there has been some improvement, but there's much more that needs to be done. Again, we heard from Haiti, just coming out of Haiti doing a focus group, understanding the basic need to food is a critical, critical need, especially for persons who are living with HIV, not even just HIV, chronic illnesses such as diabetes, other illnesses that our community have, even elder trans persons who can't even get access to elder health care because of the Bar the barriers that the barriers that are already structurally created within the country's context as it relates to the basic needs we need as human beings and as citizens to survive. So regionally, I would say that our issues are the same, and there are some progress in our there's some progress in our work, but there's more that needs to be done. We have to meet the practical needs of our community. Thank you. Thank you, future Senator DeMarco. Really appreciate that. So, you know, this is, this is really like grounding our conversation around the need for resources. And I'm pleased to say that Outright has supported UC Trans with our COVID response fund. And that was really an important way in which we have tried to provide support as an organization um, in a very critical time. We know that COVID has had a significant impact on all communities and particularly um, trans people in the region, um, trans people who are part of informal sectors and rely on the creative industry, for example, to earn and to take care of themselves. Uh, sex workers have been particularly impacted. So we are happy to be able to provide that, that level of support and we'll continue to do so in a number of ways in terms of partnering with UC Trans. And as Alexis mentioned, the Trans Caribbean Survey, and shortly I'll share the link in the chat. If you are a trans person living in the Caribbean, please respond to the survey. If you're not in the Caribbean and you'd like to help us promote the survey, please feel free to do that as well. Um, the survey is shared on our webs on, um, on our social media platforms as well. Um, so I'm happy to send the link so that you can support us as an ally and in celebration of Trans Awareness Month, which I'll always have my flag here, um, please help us in that regard. Yes. Um, so with that being said, one of the parts of the things that the survey is looking to do is to look, focus on advocacy and to see how we can gather information to better understand our communities and to have data and research and a report produced in order to hold governments accountable because it's important when we as a community go to various stakeholders the response is okay trans people are trans people in the caribbean like um alexa say said we have existed we we are here we have been here um so let us know at this time gather the information to present to say this is how trans people are what the experiences of trans people are in the region and one of the things that we do know is that or the inability of our governments to see us also feeds into the fact that there are no gender identity recognition laws or policies. So we're going to turn the conversation to this last question before we open up for questions. Um, when we, we know that in the region, a key part of affirming our identities is through inclusive policies, right? It's critical to us. And however, we're far behind at both the national and regional level in this regard. So what we know is that our communities in Latin America, for example, have had tremendous progress um, around laws that affirm their identities for trans people. So can you just say briefly, why is gender identity recognition important in the Caribbean? Um, Alexis, we'll start with you and then we'll move over to Alexa, Yaisa, and then Cesar. The importance of it is, is because it comes with a lot of intersectionality. Um, trans people are stateless. That's, that's just the bottom line to where we are. And to move from a point of statelessness in the Caribbean, the advocacy for gender identity recognition is important. And it must be a unified voice speaking to this issue. 
Gender identity recognition helps an individual, a citizen, it is your right as a citizen to be able to identify, to express yourself. These are constitutional things. But again, we have these barriers. And these barriers come from our own um, persons within our countries and in our own communities. You have the women's groups talking about, oh, we don't have um, women's equality, so how can we talk about gender identity recognition when these things are still issue for us as women? Even for migrants, they talk about migrants being stateless. How are we going to jump from a migrant issue to a trans issue? Again, it takes this collaborative effort, sitting down with stakeholders, sitting down with our allies and our true allies. And the reason why gender identity recognition is important is because we all have a right to identify. Do you know what it is to go through an airport and you're traveling and then you have your something that does not match, your gender marker does not match and they look at you and they pull you off of that TSA line. And then this is whole harassment, taking you into a back room, searching you, doing all these things to you as a human being, as a citizen. But they're not going to do that to somebody else who has the gender marker that they look at them. Okay, so this is why it's important. Accessing health care. Simple as accessing health care, going to a doctor, being able to match your name to your um, gender marker when they look at you. They don't have to call the other nurses or call the other doctors and say, oh, look at this. You know, these are the real life, these are the realities and the situations that we face. Even as far as getting an employment, these are barriers. When you fill out that application form, and even in, in, in I'm going to use, because I travel a lot doing this advocacy work, even when you fill out a customs form and they only have these two space M and M, you know what I start putting on it? I start putting trans. When I book a ticket, I start putting MS to the front of my, of my thing. These are little things that I'm doing to be able to show people and I'm writing it on these documents and when they look at these documents, okay. And then we start opening this conversation to gender identity. But we need to start having the conversation with our decision makers and our gatekeepers. Access to healthcare, access to employment, filling out that application form, that's a barrier. And that for a person, for a trans person, just to see that marker, not even there for you, it's a situation. We're not even included in the census. How do governments know that trans people exist if we're not giving them the information that they need? We're not even included in a national census. How many trans citizens are living inside of these countries? And this is the reason why we need to have this conversation with our Attorney General's office, our lawmakers and our decision makers. And this is why the importance of gender identity recognition needs to move forward within the Caribbean. And I can assure you, I am committed to fight this. I am committed to advocate for this, but I cannot do it alone. It takes a, it takes a collaborative effort. It takes me sitting down with the women's groups. It takes me sitting down with the church. It takes me sitting down with the voting, with our um, electoral boards. It takes, all of these things are intersectional. And I think moving forward in our advocacy, this collaboration, we will get what we deserve. Not what we deserve, we'll get what we, as citizens, we will get what is due to us as citizens. Because this is not a privilege. This is not some candy that you're going to give me and say, oh, you've been a good girl. You, you haven't been making noise in the media. Here you go. Here's your app. No, it's for every trans citizen living in the Caribbean region. Thank you. I think that's a great framing and a great way to, to have our, our colleagues share and add any additional comments on that. Um, we'll just, uh, just to, we have a few questions already, so we'll wrap this up shortly so that we can ensure that our panelists have space to share. But I think this is a very, this is very relevant to us. This is a reality that we, we are facing right now in this very moment um, in terms of the invisibilization of our identities um, at, the, at the government level, um, where trans people technically do not exist in the region. There is no separation of gender and sex at the basic um, understanding of these principles and why it's important for us to be, to be seen, to be recognized, to be affirmed, um, and what this means for our own well-being and for our contribution as well to nation building. So thank you very much for starting that conversation, um, Alexis. Alexa, um, the floor is yours to share just a little bit um, about what, why is gender identity recognition important in the Caribbean context? 
Okay. Um, before I start, there's just two points I want to latch on to what Alexa said. One being the fact that our human rights are what are due to us. They're not something that we must deserve or that we must earn from the powers that be. And secondly, the intersectionality that is involved when we deal with the issue of, or rather the subject of gender identity and expression being recognized in law. Um, first beginning with the fact that it is due to us because I am observing in some cases between the general cadence of certain people in government or even the way in which they go about things. Um, another fine, a fine example would be leading up to the employment bill that we had, we had a remote work bill and it was originally worded in such a way that only heterosexual couples were able to apply for their remote work visa to come and stay there was a whole backlash and then they changed it and passed the law more or less um, with gender neutral references and even putting it in such a way that anyone could tell, well, it doesn't have to be a man and woman couple. It could be a same sex couple that's coming in. Um, excuse me. And the, and the, I call it a cadence that they felt it was something just to appease the voices. It was something just to, make the make Barbados look internationally conformative for lack of better words and as much was said even during the debates on the employment discrimination bill how we needed to bring ourselves into alignment with what the rest of the of the world is doing um I even received an email that was forwarded to me uh from the ombudsman's office where again the words international trend was coming along and I had to make it abundantly clear this is not a trend. This is not something to be chic or stylish about. This is about ensuring that everyone, whether you look at it from how Alexa said, as citizens, or if you look at it from the context of people visiting Barbados, whoever comes within our jurisdiction, wherever they're from, whether or not they were born here, they have certain rights and freedoms that were theirs from the moment they came to exist. It is not something that you can take it upon yourself to take it from them or to limit in an unnecessary way. I have to use the word unnecessary because just like how you have freedom of speech, but it's limited in certain ways. There are certain limitations that may be necessary out of consideration for others but you have to be able to draw a line between those limitations that are necessary and those that are unnecessary. And when you're dealing with things such as employment discrimination prevention, you're dealing with hate crime legislation, you're dealing with striking down laws that criminalize various aspects of sexual diversity, whether it is, you know, striking down a law that criminalizes same-sex intimacy or striking down a law that criminalizes dressing in a manner that is not quote-unquote gender congruent you know um you have to look at the intersectionality of it all so again looking back at intersectionality where i have a, a matter that's before the inter-american commission on human rights and i'm aware that there's also a domestic case that has been launched challenging the same um provisions of the sexual offenses act for me, I found it necessary to embark on that particular venture because it was more than just a matter of same-sex intimacy. Just as Alexa said, here in Barbados, transgender people are more or less unheard of. We don't exist. So if I identify and present myself to the world by and large as a woman, I am involved in a relationship with a man. No common sense would say as a trans woman, I'm heterosexual. But legally speaking, since I don't exist as a woman, if I go and I engage intimately with my boyfriend or my husband, it is seen as a same-sex crime, thereby invalidating my gender identity. That's one of the reasons why it's necessary to have laws in place that recognize gender identity, that it isn't just a matter of acknowledging that trans people exist, but also affirming that we are who we are, not merely who we say we are, because some of us as many of our journeys will, say, will, will reflect, we've always had some understanding of who we were and who we are, but we just didn't, we didn't know how to put it into words. Um, 
And then, of course, when you go on to other aspects of life, how people affirm our gender identities and expressions. So, for example, if I walk into a doctor's office, I can show that doctor my Barbados ID card that says sex male, because currently there's no way for me to change that. But the doctor is going to say, OK, I need you to go behind the screen. I need you to disrobe. I'm going to do an examination check for this, that, the next and the third. He or she does that job. And then when filling out the paperwork, as I've even had at one doctor's office, when the section came to, you know, describing, OK, has the patient gone through menses? When was her, their last menstrual cycle? The doctor actually filled out that information to reflect that, no, I have not had a menstrual cycle that, you know, for whatever reason, I am unable to have a menstrual cycle rather than simply cross it out and say, well, that doesn't apply because this patient is in fact male, you know. Um, being able to have gender identity recognition laws can even impact on how those same doctors are able to do their job as they provide us with healthcare services because there will be certain people who will say, well, what that doctor did is fraudulent. But if it is a trans woman comes in and says, I am having a problem with my breasts, I need to have a mammogram done. And she opens her blouse, two, pardon my French, two big tatas are right there. The doctor has to address that, you know? So if, if it is that you have a law that wants to continue acknowledging a trans woman as being legally a male, how are you going to deal with that issue? You know, how are you going to deal with that, with that matter? Um, and that, that's, for the sake of brevity, a snippet of why or part of why it is important to have gender identity recognition. It's more than just acknowledging that trans people exist, but also allowing them to have access to the services that they require as they go through life, just like any other person. Oh, thank you, thank you very much. And I think you raised, I had a similar, I wish we had more time, I would share my experience with trying to get, get in healthcare, health insurance, and having that challenge of not being able to get health insurance based on my affirmed um, gender, um, and therefore potentially being excluded from certain services um, based on you know, my body. So we, we can have a, definitely many conversations about how the lack of gender identity recognition really puts trans people at risk and perhaps even uh, and exposes us as well to um, for some very uncomfortable and sometimes life-threatening circumstances. Uh, that, but it, I, I want to interject that right there as far as getting insurance, access to health insurance, that, is, that seems to be one, another big barrier for us as trans citizens. And speaking about these things, again, is very important. And having the conversation about it as a region and be able to present this data as far as it relates to insurance. I mean, you can't even, only thing you can get is final expense. And that, that's not what you're looking for. As a trans citizen, there are some health needs that we need. There are some things that we need that, that we just can't pay out of pocket and the insurance can help us. So this is another reason why gender identity recognition is important for the Caribbean. We must have that conversation too. Indeed. Yes, and, right. and I'm going to have... Forgive me. Uh, and forgive me. Uh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, forgive me, but I also wanted to append and confirm exactly what Alexis is saying because I even have a, a personal experience where I bought a health insurance policy a couple of years ago and I still have the contract to this day and in it, it says in no uncertain terms that the policy will not cover any... Uh, medical expenses related to, and I'm quoting here, sex changes or other elective procedures. And I had to bring it up with the insurance agent who sold me the policy because I said, hey, you didn't tell me that the contract was going to have this in here. And I told you specifically what expenses I may need to cover. Anything related to a trans person's medical transition is medically necessary. It is not elective. It's not like a nose job or a facelift. Yeah, indeed. All right, so I'm going to ask um, Yaisa uh, to just um, just give us, you know, if you can make it one minute, that'll be, sorry to cut you short, but I just don't want to go over too much. If our um, attendees would humor us a little bit, perhaps then we can have a little bit more time. But Yaisa, if you could share about why is gender identity recognition important um, for you? What is the importance of it in your, if we just use, okay, there you are. Jump right in, yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, yes. Thank you. Although in you know, the Haitian context, it's not. We're not as advanced as having healthcare and all and all that kind of stuff. But as Alexis was saying, and, and Alexa, it's the very basic, the right to have an identity. As you know, 
um, in Haiti being, again, relating to the poverty, most citizens are dependent on international aid, meaning not in having a parent or somebody who lives abroad or in Brazil or in DR to send them money, Western Union. So it's something as simple as a trans person being able to go to Western Union and having the correct ID, you know, to live off of their auntie or whoever, a friend who sends them, they're not able to. Uh, because you know you don't you don't have the ID that, that that matches you walking around the streets being addressed by the police if you're stopped, you know th these very basic things that they're very right to having an identity. And again, the issue is to, as Alexa mentioned, we have to okay, yeah, Isa, I think we lost you for a moment. Can you hear us? All right, let's give her a moment. If not, Caesar, I'm just going to ask you to jump in until we get Yaisa back. I um, just want to see if she's going to come back. All right, it seems to be frozen for a little bit longer. Um, so sorry about that. Um, we'll come back to you, Yaisa, uh, if you can hear us. Uh, Caesar, can you just go ahead and jump in and tell us a little bit from your perspective why, um, what's the importance of um, gender identity recognition? I'm going to be brief. Uh, for me, gender identity recognition is important in the Caribbean to foster good emotional and mental health among its people by setting a tone of acceptance and safety. Right? This protects an individual's right to, ex to freely express their chosen gender. It provides stealth as we read uh, on our legal documents by having our gender identity reflected on our legal documents. And this uh, helps to prevent discrimination and stigma on the basis of gender identity and gender reassignment. Thank you. Very Sorry. short indeed. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Yaisa, yes. Sorry, I'm love back. The connection. Yeah. Yeah, I know, connection yeah. issues. So just what we're saying, the basic needs are having an identity. Uh, you know, being able to find work, those who can, who even know you're qualified, but not having an identity, not having the proper ID, other recognition, you know, you know bars makes it even more difficult. So in a nutshell, <laughs> so it is very important <laughs> in the Haitian context and as the Caribbean context overall. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, so um, I know we had two questions in the chat. Um, we have a few more minutes. Um, myself and um, Alexis were answering the questions in the chat. So I don't know if anyone else um, who's been listening has a burning question for us um, that we can take live and respond to. We have about three to five more minutes. If um, you can add a little two minutes near on the end there um, to take any of your questions. I know this was a rich conversation. Um, I just want to say while we wait for questions that you can, we're going to share the, the link to the document um, to you. And if the panelists are interested, I can also share their email addresses. So if you'd like to contact them uh, for any follow-up conversations as well, that we're very much open to that. And also feel free to reach out to Outright. Um, you can reach out to, to me directly as well, just if you have any, any questions. Um, and also another thing to add is that we have Out Summit coming up, which will be another opportunity where we'll be having a global conversation around trans issues on December 11 at 1 p.m. EST. So I invite you to join and, and my colleague is sharing with you shortly the, um, the registration information to join Out Summit because we know that this is not enough. This is not enough time to have a very deep conversation around trans issues. But as it's Trans Awareness Month, we really wanted to spotlight what, where we are in the Caribbean context and to ensure that there is space for myself and my colleagues um, to share about our realities and how much more work is, is needed in our region. Um, so I'm just looking to see if there are any questions. Um, one of the, the questions asked, asked about um, how to strategies in terms of public perception. I think we need everyone on board. We need families to affirm trans people. We need families to not put their trans kids out on the streets. Um, we need families to stand up, right? We need allies to really ensure that they are not silent when trans people are not in the space, spaces, to ensure that we ask people their pronouns. It's not only when we're in a space that, that, that is dealing with, that trans people are involved, that we should normalize 
pronoun, asking people their pronouns to normalize, um, that trans people are part of our communities, that we are not villains, uh, and that will go a long way. That, that basically sets the, the standard and the framework for how we engage. Um, and we also know that the LGBTQ community has a large role to play as well. So also, you know, ensuring that as a community, we are in solidarity with each other, with our movements and beyond the LGBTQ community as well. So we, all of us have a role to play um, in ensuring that our communities are, are affirmed. All right, so I see we have one question from James. How do you fundraise for each organization's work? And do you access and how do you access international LGBTIQ funds? So I can respond to that to say that in terms of fundraising, Outright plays a very large role in, in supporting UC Trans as our partner and um, helping to fundraise. So efforts are very much um, underway. For example, UC, Outright supported UC Trans with their registration and uh, provided UC Trans also with a, a grant that is one of the first multi-year grant that UC Trans has access to. So fundraising efforts, if you'd like to know more again, if you are, if this, is, this is an opportunity where if you are able to provide resources um, to UC Trans or to through Outright, please feel free to reach out to us. I'm happy to have a conversation around that. UC Trans is happy to participate in that process as well, as we know resources are very, very limited. The trans community get, gets the least amount of resources that comes to work for LGBTIQ um, organizing. So with that being said, in the interest of time and respecting the fact that we did advertise this as, um, I, so we have a burning question from Millie and as a Millie um, from Guyana, Millie, please go ahead and ask your question. We'll take that last question before um, we wrap up, if that's okay. Uh, so maybe if you can just type your question in the Q&A or in the chat, either one works. Um, if you can do that as quickly as possible so that we can close, please. Just looking out for Millie's question. Uh, maybe I'm not seeing your question and I'm just trying to make sure that we stick to the, our time frame. So I'm just going to give you about another minute and wait for your question. If not, if it's, if it's anything that you could um, probably share with myself or Alexis afterwards, I'm happy to, to have a conversation with you. All right, I believe the question is, uh, the question from Melissa Lewis. Is there a society in your country that protects the rights of trans people? And what would be the next step to gain resources to include the trans community? Um, thank you for that question. Um, if any of the panelists would like to also take that, feel free to jump in. I would say that the, the, if by what you mean is society is an organization, I would say in the region, there is UC Trans, which is a United Caribbean Trans Network, which is the region's first regional body that protects the rights of trans people. At the national level as well, there are national organizations. For example, um, there are some members right here in this group from um, Proud to be Trans out of Guyana, has joined. Um, there, um, there is an organization, Butterfly Barbados, um, is a one of the uh, another organization that's in the group. Um, out of Jamaica, there is also Transwave Jamaica. So there are many small organizations in the region that have been promoting the rights for trans people for many, many, many years. And so the next step to gain in resources is this is the step in terms of ensuring that we have the space to name what our issues are, and then to um, to do fundraising efforts, which Outright actively does, to provide resources um, to our communities um, actively. So this is another way that we, we listen to our communities. We ensure that the communities that are on the ground, that are doing the work, um, we provide opportunities to do um, proposals jointly with them to, to respond to their needs. So that's a very quick, short answer um, in the interest of time. So thank you very much for raising that question. I'll go ahead and take uh, Millie's question as it relates to how we're going to approach government on the issues. And this is why <clears throat> the regional network is so important, and this is the work of UC Trans, to be able to sit with decision makers and stick with gatekeepers. Because as we know, we've been engaging with um, governments through our OAS system, through the inter-American system. And however, what happens is because governments change, we have to continue that work. And that work requires us having to 
stay in constant communication. When one government changes, we have to make sure that we tackle the incoming government. The, um, and that, that seems to be one of the challenges that we have. So you might have a government that is progressive and everything is moving good in that first five years or that first four years. But the minute another government changes, who opposes these things, your work starts all over again. You have to sensitize, you have to um, educate, you have to go back into the fields. And this is why it is important for us to use, for UC Trans, to be able to be supported for our work, to be able to strategically, especially within the Caribbean region, as it relates to tackling government. And the thing about it is we have to constantly, like I say, sensitize and educate them on the issues that trans citizens face within the region. And doing this work collectively, joining with the UN, joining with the OAS, joining with the Inter-American Commission. And these were things we were doing prior to funding. So with funding, we can get more work accomplished and we can make more inroads. That's why supporting us is very important and supporting the work of our advocacy is very important to reach our decision makers and our gatekeepers. Thank you for that. And I would like to also say that donate to the causes, donate to Outright, donate to the groups on the ground. Um, this is very important. And we have Manuel from the um, Inter-American Commission on, on Human Rights joining us um, on this webinar. There are different bodies that we partner with to ensure that we are holding governments accountable. So thank you all for like, participating, for joining in this work, for your interest in, in advancing trans rights. And one minute, one minute before you end the um, okay. thing, I see this thing which says, please keep the UPI uh, Robert Trade OAS in mind. We are launching a report on trans and diverse persons. Yes, and this is, a, and, and, and the reason I wanna talk about this little point right here, because the context of Latin America as it relates to advocacy with decision makers and policy makers is totally different when it comes to CARICOM countries. 17 CARICOM countries coming from this one um, background, our advocacy tools are totally different and that's why we need the support and we need our own strategic plans as it relates to how do we move forward with our decision makers and our policy makers in the Caribbean region. Yeah, thank you for that. And I think that just to say as well that or the report that Outright is hope will be producing from the survey uh, with, in partnership with UC Trans is that important step because it is a groundbreaking bit of research that will account for the realities of trans people in the Caribbean context. You know, French speaking, English speaking, all across the Caribbean, we are, will be accounting for our realities in that way. So thank you so very much for your time and for supporting the work of Outright, for supporting UC Trans and all our partners on the ground, and for taking the time to celebrate Trans Awareness Month with us, particularly Trans Week, and I will probably always wave this flag because my community means the very best to me. So thank you to the panelists for joining. Thank you so much, Alexis, um, Elijah, Yaisa, and Alexa for joining. And thank you for all our attendees for sharing space with us today. Thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your morning, your afternoon, and your evening. Thank you kindly. Bye, everybody. <laughs>